This is water glass, yeah? I don't know. 
This is the Dalmatian, right? Yeah. They're unrelated, completely unrelated. Oh, oh, yeah. That, okay. But I'm just saying. No. Okay. Okay. It's an animal. Okay. It doesn't help you at all. Actually, it's with a committee, like a three-panel committee, the director of postgraduate studies, the like graduate courses controller, and then like another... Oh, this light is yeah. flickering in a very unpleasant way. Is this giving it headaches is. to the people who are sitting underneath it? Absolutely. So lower, <laughs> That's not much better, is it? You can put that light on on the far left, on, and it puts on the little tiny ones. As I, is that better? You really I mean, don't what's want to really better? You really don't want to sit under a flickering light. It's just messed up. Yeah, it's miserable. Have there been fMRI studies that show that it's done? Almost certainly. Oh. I don't know. Probably. <laughs> so Flicker, the, the flickering light headache area lights up. There. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so today's today's class is a little bit different. This is going to be about everybody's favorite subject, statistics. Um, and uh, so, so I was actually so I am very very grateful for any feedback okay, that anybody gives me. And I was actually given. Very interesting piece of feedback last week, which I appreciate very much. But I'm curious as to whether uh, whether other people feel this way, which is 
that um, that I may. So you know, you guys are all from very diverse backgrounds, and some of you have, you know, some of you are undergrads, some of you have done this stuff for years and years already, and I, I'm probably trying, maybe trying a little bit too hard to kind of keep everything on a kind of gentle gentle curve such that, you know, it's kind of intuitive. And, and I was given a piece of feedback, which I appreciate, and uh, I'm curious as to whether uh, this is true, that I maybe have been going a little bit too too gently, you know, kind of like uh, really, you know, almost to the point of, uh, I don't know, having my foot on the brake pedal too hard. Is that is that something that people have found a little bit? Or I mean, I'm sure that for some, I know for a fact that for some of you, this is a, everything that we've done is extremely familiar and easy. But uh, but maybe not for others of you. So anyway, there's no need whatsoever for people to you know like like if someone here is thinking no no I think it's still being too difficult you probably don't want to say that but you can tell me or you can you know post it anonymously or anything. But I'm very grateful for feedback um, and uh, I think especially because there's really a diverse group of people in the room which I think is great. I'm very happy that there is. But I think that means that you know it, it's extremely likely that I'm not going to be you know, maybe going at the right level for all of you all the time. So, you know, the more the more you kind of tell me, hey, you know, I wouldn't mind a little bit more detail, or you know, that bit was a bit unclear or something. Or, you know, just anything like that. That that would be useful, useful feedback. So I would encourage that. So, so today's class is actually going to talk about some topics which are kind of confusing. So, uh, so maybe this is. You know, I'm going to try, hopefully, to not make them too confusing, but. Um, but this will be, you know, I, I think I can, I think it's quite likely that this class will not be, will not seem excessively gentle. Or, hey, if it does, I'll be happy, but, uh, but it probably won't. Because statistics, let's face it, statistics tends to be confusing. Uh, is there anyone here who doesn't find statistics confusing? A little bit. Is there anyone here who does find statistics a bit confusing sometimes? Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, and this is this is kind of this is kind of the way that people are built. If you find statistics a bit confusing sometimes, it's partly just the fact that you're a human being because we're not really designed. It appears that we're not really designed very well to think about things like conditional probability and stuff like that. And there's all kinds of well-known. Um, biases and errors in human reasoning, and a lot of them actually related to probability and statistics. And that stuff is just confusing. But also, you know, there's another reason why it tends to be confusing. It's often presented in a kind of confusing way. So I can't do anything about, about you know, the fact that we're not really built for understanding conditional probabilities, but I'm going to try my best to make it uh, not presented in a confusing way. But um, you know, my main way of finding out if that's happening or not is you guys saying, hey, this is confusing or not confusing. And, and of this, this of, of all classes, if, you know, you should definitely, definitely not feel kind of shy about saying that's confusing, because it's highly likely that half the people in the room will, find, will be finding it confusing too, so don't be shy about that. Um, okay, now, one thing that I find, I personally find a little bit strange about statistics is um, that they can seem, it can seem that doing science and doing statistics are really like the same thing. And maybe they're not. So, so here's a little quick quick poll. And you know, some of you will know the answer, some of you don't. It's fine if you don't. But this, I think it's just kind of striking. Okay, so does any, when were statistics, i.e., you know, values for rejecting hypothesis, t-tests, that kind of stuff. When was it invented? We'll do one of these humming polls so that you can't see, can't see, you know, like who's who's humming. So, so, so for answer, so for, so for answer A, early 1700s. Who, 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 who wants to hum, saying that like that? Yes. Okay. For for answer B, early 1800s. Any hummers? Man, you guys are historically well uh, <laughs> well informed. <laughs> My humming tests are all are all crashing and burning. Okay, I'm gonna add. Maybe I should add in one extra answer here just to avoid you know everyone get. Okay, early 1900s. Okay, so so a, a to me this was surprising. I don't know. Have you all known this since like birth or something? But 
To me, this was a surprising fact when I found out. No, I was actually introduced to a statistics, a stats course like this. Oh, really? They yeah, were like, hey, this, this is more recent fact. than you think? Yeah. Okay, okay. Because to me, it's kind of surprising. And the reason why it's especially surprising to... So these are like some of the main guys. Obviously, you guys know all this because you, you, you were, were not humming to all aspect. But the, you know, the, the first real kind of proper book saying, you know, like, here's how you do statistics was not written until 1925. Now, a lot of really good science happened before 1925, including all kinds of things which you would just think it would be absolutely impossible for, I mean, it's kind of, you know, put into our brains from day one of entering university that it would just be ridiculous to try and do these things without proper statistics. For instance, develop a vaccine and figure out if it works, right? You would, you would get fired on the spot these days if you said, oh, I have a new vaccine, I'm going to see how it works, but, you know, we don't need to bother with all that statistics stuff. Right? Well, they didn't have statistics stuff, okay? So, so you know, what happened? Um, genetics, right? Genetics is all about, you know, will some proportion of people you know, uh, or, you know, Ps in Mendel's case acquire these traits and some proportion acquire these traits, and it's all about, um, you know, figuring out ratios of things. He didn't have any statistics. There's actually an interesting little story about, about this, uh, which is that Fisher, like the, this guy, actually went back and analyzed some of Mendel's data on kind of acquired characteristics of pea plants, I think it was and decided that Mendel might have actually kind of fudged his data a bit because uh, this is a whole controversy. I have no idea if Mendel actually did fudge his data, but um, it looked kind of a bit too clean. Right? But you didn't even, there wasn't even the very concept of what does it mean and how would you even quantify it for data to look a bit too clean didn't even exist back then. But he was in the meantime, you know, laying the foundations of of modern science, and lots and lots and lots of other things, all of which involves, any, you know, anyone who's ever made a measurement knows that when you measure stuff, it's noisy, okay? And so you get, you know, like, distributions, and you have to figure out, well, am I measuring noise, am I measuring something real? And somehow people manage to do, uh, to do science without any of that stuff. So, so this is, now, this is not an argument for saying, oh, well, you know, hey, don't worry about statistics. But it is an argument, or I think it's an argument, for saying <clears throat> that you know it can really feel like statistics is is the kind of uh, you know the criterion of of scientific validity, and that just can't be the case because otherwise no one would have been able to do any science until you know the 1910s or 1920s, uh, when people did some pretty amazing science before 1910s and 1920s. So here's a metaphor. I'm sure I'm not the first, first person to say it, but this is. So, so you might say that, and this is just you know my personal view, but I think I think probably quite a few people would agree with this. You know, doing sex is kind of like putting on your seatbelt when you drive. Of course, when you drive, you should go put on your seatbelt. Um, but um, you know, you can have your seatbelt on, and if you're unlucky or you're a bad driver or you're drunk or something like that, you can still it still isn't going to save you from a big crash. And similarly, uh, you might drive home and say, ah, I don't want to wear my seatbelt, and you might be just fine. Okay. So, so in science, the, really, the thing that really, really matters is finding a true underlying regularity in nature, whatever that means. Okay. Uh, and the, the best possible test for whether you've actually done that is you say, hey, we found this thing. Here's how we found it. You guys go off and find it and look for it. See if you find it. And if they find it too, that strongly suggests you're onto the right thing. So replication, an independent replication, very important. But, um, uh, but, but that doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily, so stats, getting your stats right doesn't at all guarantee that someone's going to be able to independently replicate it, because that depends on kind of quite a few things. Um, and even getting your stats wrong, or not even having any stats, doesn't at all mean that people won't be able to go off and independently replicate it, because that's what the entire world of science was based on until you know the 1910s, 1920s. So, um, so anyway, so that's a way of thinking about it. So this is a suggestion for, you know, I think this stuff is important to to think about uh, and to know, but it's not necessarily the be all and end all. Um, 
we happen to have a, a stats expert who just walked into the room. Florian, I have a question for you. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to, okay. This is Florian Jaeger, uh, linguistics and, and also a stats expert, who knows much more about stats than I ever will. I have a question for you. Is this a reasonable statement in your view? Let me just instantaneously take a Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Let me give you a minute and, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, that, that's the problem with being a stats expert. Everyone always wants, wants answers from you. I'm trying to say yeah, that, yeah. And, and, and the bit I said before is how, how um, um, you know, People did pretty good science before statistics even came along, just by basically doing replication. So I'm not dissing statistics. I'm not saying you know don't bother with statistics. I'm saying that it's not some kind of like magical replication <coughs> juice. You know. Absolutely, yeah, I absolutely agree. Okay, it's okay. Often overlooked. Okay, well that makes me feel a lot better. Okay, so we have here an independent replication. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <Whoa. laughs> so. Um, so anyway, and different people feel different about it. So for instance, um, there is actually, there is actually, uh, this is a little bit irrelevant, but there is actually one state in the United States where it's not, uh, you're not legally obliged to wear a seatbelt in the front seat. Does anyone know where it is? New Hampshire. There you go. Yeah, I used to live in New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, it is considered a gross infringement of personal liberty to force <laughs> you to, really, to force you to wear a, um, a seatbelt or to force a motorcyclist to wear a helmet. Yes. Actually, if your uh, family has been in New Hampshire for at least th three generations, you don't have to follow any law in New Hampshire. What? No. Uh, like, no, like besides, like some basic ones, like anything to do with cars, anything like that. You can just go You're considered grandfather. <laughs> I'm sure that's one that like you can't, but like pretty much anything you don't really? have to follow after three generations of being in really? New Hampshire. Yeah. I did not know that. Is yeah. that really true? Yeah. Wow, I used to live in New Hampshire, but obviously not for three generations. <laughs> wow, yeah, really? Because it's, cause, cause it's uh, uh, like your le like legacy there or something. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, how You're about literally that? grandfathered in. Yeah. Yeah, wow, oh, I like it. Well, that's very interesting. And, and, uh, okay, so, so anyway, so, there, you know, so it's not the case that everyone in New Hampshire is dying left, right, and center from car accidents. So I wouldn't be in the time space surprised if they do have a slightly high rate. But there's not that many cars in New Hampshire. If you haven't been to New Hampshire, you know, you're more likely to get eaten by a bear than to have a, a car accident. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so uh, so statistics is a little bit like that. So, so statistics, statistics can get a bit confusing. And in fact, one of the things we're going to talk about in this class is that there have been confusions, and there probably still are confusions in statistics, never mind. Right? But um, I wouldn't let this worry you too much because, you know, the real thing that matters is is kind of you know finding regularities in nature and statistics is just a means towards the end. Okay, so uh, so one of the one of the main things um, that people have to worry about a lot in fMRI is multiple comparisons. So we talked a bit about how um, when you um, when you scan a brain, the, the scanner kind of you know virtually slices the brain into different slices in like x, y, and z direction, and so you end up with a lot of different voxels in the brain. You know, you might have 30 slices this way, and each one might be 64 by 64. So you might end up with thousands, and th you will end up with thousands and thousands of voxels. And we were looking a little bit, um, two weeks ago, I guess, at ways in which you could do a test of whether a particular voxel is activated by given stimulus. So you can say, okay, here's the predicted activation. You know, if I have a stimulus, it t equals 10, and I would predict a certain pattern of activation, a time pattern, which would be this kind of hemodynamic response function. I can go and look and see whether the voxel time course actually contains something like that, and I can say, well, what's the degree of fit? And uh, so now I've done a test on that voxel to say, is that voxel activated by this particular stimulus? And um, you can run that on every single one of these voxels. So next thing you know, you've done 30,000 tests. So. Um, but anyway, what, what is a potential problem with doing 30,000 tests? Time. Time is a very good, time is a very good problem. It's going to take, if you don't have a computer, it's going to take a long time to do that. Actually, that's a very, very interesting point. I bet that there's multiple comparisons 
I'm sure there's people who know more about Sinai, but I bet this multiple comparison problem didn't really arise that much before computers came along. That's probably true, actually. That's a very interesting point. There's a whole class of problems. There's a whole class of things you can do. People call this, I guess, big data, you know, which actually is a big initiative in the University of Rochester in a minute. There's a whole class of things that you can do when you have computers and you get to like kind of trawl through lots of data that you just couldn't do without computers, but it raises its own set of problems too. So what, what is one of the problems potentially with, uh, with you know, saying, is this thing significantly activated? Is this thing significantly activated? And doing that 30,000 times. Yes, sorry. Okay. Well, not only is it a multiple comparisons problem where you set your threshold high enough, like at P0.05 level, one in 20 of those tests is going to turn false, false positive. Uh -huh. But also the assumption of independent, one in the test for each voxel also assumes that um, each voxel is independent of the other, right? OK, that's right. That was actually that was actually a very sophisticated answer. So we're going to actually spend a, a fair bit of the class actually kind of unpacking what the answer is. So you know, because so not, not all, probably you know not all of you will already be familiar with that, but that's that's actually you know basically the perfect answer. You you, you no longer need to you know listen to the next <laughs> hour of the lesson, but you can obviously. Um, so uh, so 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 Curry's answer really contained a lot of important things. So this idea of a false positive, <coughs> false positive, is I mean you've probably all encountered it, but it, it turns out that these things are a little trickier to think about than you might imagine. So a false positive is you know, you think there's something there and there's nothing there. So, so if I've got 30,000 voxels and suppose, and you can, people run these kind of simulations actually, and we'll show an example of that later. Uh, if you've got 30,000 voxels and you say, I'm going to specify that they all just contain random noise. That by, by design, there's nothing in there, okay, which you can't do with real data, but you can if you just simulate some data. And I say, okay, I've got a whole bunch of random noise. And I'm just going to say, is there a signal here? Is there a signal here? Is there a signal here? Every now and again, random noise just kind of you know, looks like a signal. It looks like the, the voxel goes up a lot, just at the exact, there happens to be a little spike of noise, just at the exact time that the, or a, little, you know, a few seconds after the stimulus came in. And as far as your test is concerned, it's like, aha, I found a signal. And um, if you, you know, it doesn't happen very often because it's just random noise. But if you have lots and lots of tests, eventually it's going to happen quite a lot. So, for, so if you set some kind of threshold and you say, I want to make sure that I only get 5% false positives, which is kind of a standard kind of setting, then you know, you're going to have you know, 600 false positive losses or something. So we have to find some way of dealing with that. Um, and then the second part of, of Curry's very uh, you know, fully worked out answer was to say, well, you know, how are you going to deal with that? Are you actually going to say, I've measured 30,000 independent things, so I have to correct it as if I've run 30,000 separate tests. Well, maybe not, because maybe you haven't actually really, really run 30,000 separate tests. It just kind of looks like you have. Uh, so we're going uh, so to we're going to talk more about that in, in a few minutes. But um, here's a kind of example of that. Suppose uh, suppose you're measuring the um, the height of the tide going up and down at the beach. And you say, I want to get a really, really good measurement of the height of the tide going up and down the beach. So I'm going to go out onto the beach every two minutes and measure the height of the tide, and then go back again, and then you know keep on doing that. And then I'm going to have you know 30 measurements an hour, and I'm going to have you know hundreds and hundreds of measurements of the height of the tide. I'm going to have the best measure of the height of the tide you could possibly get. Well, you haven't really made. 30 separate measurements of the height of tide all the time because you know each one of those you could just skip half the measurements and just fill in the blanks because they're all going to be the neighboring measurements are going to be very very similar to each other so you haven't really learned anything new each you know when you go out two minutes later and say oh it's almost exactly the same as it was two minutes ago right? this is not a very informative measurement and you can quantify that and you can basically say well you know there's a very there's a lot of correlation over time in uh, if I know what the height of the tide is at 10.51 a.m. in the morning, I can have a pretty good guess of what the height of the tide is at 10.53 a.m. in the morning without needing to go out and do another measurement. They're highly correlated, and so you know it feels like you've made lots of measurements, but actually you haven't. And in fact, almost exactly the same thing happens in fMRI. 
um, in two senses. One in the sense of over time, because we saw how the, uh, the, um, the underlying signal that we're really tapping into is this slow, slow blood oxygenation response that goes up and down over a period of several seconds. So that's one sense in which you're not getting as many measures. Another is that two voxels that might be running just a couple of millimeters away from each other, because you don't have a perfect you know, your, your scanner does not have perfect resolution. It's really seeing a kind of blurry picture of each of those voxels, and so they're kind of blurring into each other quite a lot. Not to mention all of the blurring due to, you know, big veins flowing around and people's heads moving and things like that. So you're not really getting completely separate measurements in space. This is you're not really getting completely separate measurements in time mode. So, um, so those are ways of uh, trying to figure out, you know, how many comparisons did you actually make? But the kind of initial problem is you made a lot of comparisons, and so you're just going to get a whole bunch of false positives. And so, uh, so I, you know, I sent a link to this in the email, but I, it's really, it's kind of worth looking at this because. So, before I, how many, just out of interest, how many of you before I sent an email had already seen or occasionally look at XKCD? Probably quite a lot of you. Okay. Was there anyone who I actually introduced to XKCD with that email? I hope maybe one person. Oh, good. Okay. Really? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, this. Is... Okay. Good. Yeah. Well, I feel very good. happy about that because this well, may be the single most useful thing you get from this. Time. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. <laughs> I'm indebted. Yeah. It was better to tell me that sent that out before. Okay. So anyway, so just a bit of context. So it, it, it may seem kind of a little bit silly to talk about cartoon and you know science stuff, but this guy XKCD, he's actually, he's called Randall Mon Monroe. He's actually a computer scientist, engineer, or some sort. He actually has a lot of technical background, and a lot of his cartoons are actually kind of about science and statistics and math and things like that. And um, the guy just explains stuff, you know, better than almost anybody else. So it's actually not a joke to say you can get a really good explanation of things of things from XKCD, and that's actually true. Um, and, you know, he's kind of funny, too. So, uh, so jelly beans cause acne. Scientists investigate, but we're playing Minecraft. But we found no link, we found no link between jelly beans and acne. Uh, the p-value is greater than 0.05. So that's it, then. I, um, oh, no, wait, wait. There's only a certain color that, that causes it. And then, and then they go through, and they say, we found no relation between purple jelly beans and acne. No relation between brown jelly beans and blah, 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 pink jelly beans. Okay, so they're doing lots and lots of tests. And then um, uh, he always draws people like these kind of stick figures. This is what scientists look like in X case. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we know found no relation with gray or tan or cyan. Never knew there were so many colors of jelly beans. We oh, wait, we found the link between green jelly beans and acne. Whoa, what? what? Um, and then news headline comes the next day. Green jelly beans lead to acne. Ninety-five percent confidence. Only five percent chance of coincidence. And then there's, there's, yet, there's actually another. There's another nice thing about XKCD, which is if you go to the, um, if you go to the, the the website and you kind of float your mouse over the cartoon, you get you get. Uh, how many of you who are XKCD fans knew about the little mouse float over trick? Okay, I'm good. You're okay. So anyway, if you float the mouse over the cartoon, you get like a little kind of extra joke, which is some extra text, which actually often contains some extra real insight, and it does in this case too. So you float over and you get, um, uh, so uh, we did the green study again and we got no link. It was probably a research conflicted on green jelly bean acne link. More study recommended. <laughs> <laughs> so so this, this cartoon, you know, it's just a cartoon. Okay, just a cartoon. Um, actually really does contain you know, the essence of what the multiple comparisons problem is. So if you run the same test over and over and over again, with, you know, in this case, slight variation of you know, different color jelly bean you know, in the brain, different voxel each time, in a genetic gene-wide association study, it might be looking at you know, 10,000 genes at the same time. Um, in fact, people run into these problems in genetics a lot too. Uh, then you're going to get, you know, some things are just going to spuriously crop up just due to noise. And then what happens? So th this, this little mouse over text actually really is quite insightful. Okay, so, so then you say, okay, we found the result. And then someone goes off and tries to replicate it. Remember, replication is the only real test of, of whether, um, whether you've really found something real in nature. And, and you know, if, if you've really got some kind of problem in your stats, then it's actually quite likely that it's not going to replicate. Um, and then 
well, what does that mean? Well, then you have a problem, right? Then, then, well, you, you know, you have a, you have these two conflicting reports. One, one, one says one thing, another says another thing, and so then, what are you going to do? Well, then you're just going to study more, and it, it all gets a bit messy. So, I'm going to, I'm going to stop talking about cartoons in a minute, but I do want to show you this one as well, which is also actually quite insightful into statistics as well. I think. Let's give you a minute. <laughs> And this is the mouse over text at the bottom, which I think, which is also actually, I think, quite so. <laughs> Correlation does not imply causation, but it does waggle his eyebrows suggestively and gesture furtively while mouth. <laughs> so, uh, oh, there was one other, one, one other thing I wanted to say as well, which is the XKG is so full, XKCD is so full of actual insights that there's an entire website, probably more actually now, devoted to um, <laughs> explaining, this is not by the cartoons themselves, this is by other people, explaining what's happening in XKCD. And so if you want to read more about, you know, the background to like multiple comparisons testing, you can literally go to explain XKCD. Anyway, so this is, uh, so you can actually learn a lot about statistics from a cartoon. Okay, so so that that's that's me trying to kind of keep things Intuitively easy. Now, now I'm going to try and uh, try and mess with your heads a little bit. Okay. So, so here's where this is actually a little confusing. This bit. Okay. Um, so, should we do one of these turn to your neighbor things? We could. Do? Okay. What what do, okay? What does it actually mean to say that the result x is statistically significant that p is less than 0.05? What does that actually mean? I guarantee you that it may not mean what you think. That doesn't make sense. I guarantee it may not be what you think. <laughs> this, is actually, this is actually a more difficult question than it looks. In fact, people are actually kind of sort of still fighting about this question. That's actually a true statement. So, um, so well, I'll, I'll give you some... Uh, we'll, we'll skip the, the turn to your neighbor thing because it takes too much time, but, uh, which was useful feedback, by the way. But, uh, but we're going to take a vote. Okay? So we can do the humming vote. And here I, I think it's pre I'm, I'm pretty sure that you won't all actually... Um, all vote for the same thing. I'll, I'll show you all of the different options, and then we'll have, okay. So here's one possibility. Okay. Given the data that we found, there's only a 5% chance that result X is, is false. Okay, you, we'll start humming in a minute once. Okay, here's another one. <coughs> if result X were false, then there would only be a 5% chance of us finding the data that we did find. It doesn't, at first glance, look all that different from A. Okay. See, if some other people now go off and look for result X, there's only a 5% chance that they'll fail to find it. And they, so these all basically mean the same thing. Okay, so uh, so let's let's do a little bit. I told you it was going to get more confusing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but my hope is to, 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 de to deconfuse you after after trying to kind of mess with your heads like this. Okay, so so everyone who thinks it's the answer is A, kind of hum a bit. I'm hearing a little bit of humming, <laughs> tiny bit. Okay, everyone who thinks the answer is B, hum a bit. Okay, everyone who thinks the answer is C, hum a bit. I heard a little bit of humming. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, everyone who thinks the answer is D, hum a bit. Man, it's hard to mess with your guys' heads. <laughs> <laughs> You're uh, okay. Mm. I would say to have, okay, so you guys actually most of you hum for me, that's actually the right answer. Okay. But um, it's kind of a mouthful even to say what the difference is between 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 the first one and the second one. They do look awfully similar. To my eyes at least they look awfully similar. It turns out that you have to kind of work quite hard to really make them look different from each other. Um, and uh, now are any of you um, I know at least one, two. Are any of you either in med school or hoping to go to med school or in some shape or form engaged with the process of being interested in becoming a doctor or already are a doctor or something? So at least at least some of you. Okay. So one of the many joys that you will have going to med school is having this kind of stuff rammed into your head. But uh, with the stuff, well, the stuff that I'm about to talk about. Um, uh, 
but it's actually, the studies have shown that despite the fact that every doctor gets this stuff around their head, most doctors actually then get this wrong when asked about it later, because it's very non-intuitive. Okay, so it's all to do with base rate. So you probably, have, have you encountered, you'll also, if you do anything medical related, you'll, 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 um, you'll get these sort of sensitivity and specificity of those, if you, if you encounter these questions. Okay, so they kind of, these are actually good labels. These are labels that actually kind of, the, um, the, the name of the label actually captures something about what it is. Unlike the terms type one and type two error, which in my opinion are the worst <laughs> labels in the whole world. <laughs> because uh, I can never remember, well, I have to look it up every time which one is which because they're totally meaningless. So this is the same reason, by the way, why if you're programming, you know, it's, it's usually not a good idea to call your variables things like A and B and X and Y and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, okay, so, and there's a very, very nice uh, paper, I didn't put this in the readings, but if you're into this kind of thing, there's a, there's a kind of classic and quite famous paper called Earth is Round, P is less than 0.05, that talks a lot about this kind of thing and basically explains all the ways in which this stuff can actually trip you up. Uh, and I'm, I'm really not kidding when I say that people are still fighting about what, what the best way to do statistical testing is. This paper proposes a certain way of doing it, and there's no consensus whatsoever in the field about that. Okay, so, so let's go back uh, to this question of uh, which, you know, you, you humming folks basically got right. But let's go, let's kind of unpack a little bit, and we're going to tie this back to brain imaging in a minute. Um, let's unpack a little bit. Uh, what the difference is between these things that kind of look a little bit similar, okay? So this one A that says, given the data, so, so result X will call a hypothesis, okay? A hypothesis is um, that, you know, there's this thing called X that happens in the world. Or often in statistics, people do it the other way around. They say there's a null hypothesis that you're just trying to kind of get rid of, and you say that that null hypothesis would be that there isn't this thing called X in the world, okay? Um, so, uh, but the, you know, the hypothesis part is the stuff about whether X exists in the world or not. Okay. So, so this, this statement, which you, you, know, you guys didn't really hum for very much, but no disrespect <coughs> if you did hum for it, because this is confusing stuff. Okay. So, given the data that we found, there's only 5% chance that result X is false. So this is saying something about, given the data, we're going to make some conclusion about the hypothesis. Okay. So this little sign here, this vertical sign here is kind of, probability statistics jargon for given, meaning, you know, if we if we work on the operating assumption that that we that this data just is there, then what what can we infer about the hypothesis? Um, and uh, you know, those of you I know some of you are graduate students in this department of brain culture sciences, there's a lot of people, uh, including people here who do uh, are very interested in uh, uh, kind of Bayesian approaches, which are all about trying to figure out the relation between hypothesis and data. Uh, so, so this other, the second option B, that kind of looks kind of similar, um, is actually exactly the opposite way around. And the fact that it's exactly the opposite way around, but looks kind of similar, is more or less one of the key reasons why statistics is a bit confusing. Um, okay, so. Uh, so if result X were false, then it would only be a 5% chance of us finding the data that we did find. Okay, so this is saying, if something about the hypothesis, the hypothesis is, you know, is this stuff called X out there in the world? <coughs> Given, if that were the case, if result X were false, then what kind of data would we expect? So this is probability data given the hypothesis. So notice that these are the opposite way around. Now here's yet another reason why this stuff is a little bit confusing, which is the thing that we care about is the hypothesis. Right? That's the whole reason why we're doing these tests in the first place. We care about the hypothesis. We want to find out, is this thing called result X out there in the world or not? Okay? So why, so, but notice that this is, the one, this is the one that the statistical test actually gives you. The, you might think, given that what we really care about is the hypothesis, then you might think that you'd really want something like this, okay, which says, okay, well, I collect some data and I use, you know, use that data to in infer something about the hypothesis. Sounds very reasonable. Um, and yet, the kind of test that we actually do is the other way around. It says, okay, I collect some data and then I say, well, if the hypothesis were a certain thing, would I have gotten this data? Now, 
there's, you know, there's this thing based there that makes a relationship between these two, but it's not, you know, but the, the crucial thing is that they're not the same thing. Okay, and we'll give an example, give an example in a second of how they're not the same thing, and this is the kind of example they're gonna make you do a thousand times in medical school, but, you know, even after doing it a thousand times, it's still not intuitive. I mean, I don't know, I mean, maybe, <clears throat> maybe none of you guys find this, find this a little uh, puzzling, but to me it's, it, it's, 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 Surprising on its face that given that the thing you really care about is the hypothesis and given that the thing that you collect is the data that we're not going this way and saying, you know, let's infer from a data and let's make some conclusion about the hypothesis. And the reason, the reason why you come to this is it's very, very difficult to actually make inferences about hypothesis. It's much easier to, I mean, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but it's much easier to collect data than it is to kind of, you know, figure out whether things are out there in the world. You have to kind of work pretty hard to figure out whether things are out there in the world. Okay, so um, so what's this other one, C, that I think maybe one or two people uh, hum for, which is fine. Uh, if other people now go off and look for result X, there's only a 5% chance that they'll find it. Uh, again, this is saying, uh, okay, we collected some data, and now we're going to make some statement, oh yeah, it looks like result X is going to be true. So here again, you go, this is why this is, you know, these two are different. This, this one is more like this one, okay? They're both basically trying to make some statement about result X, which is, you know, seems reasonable because that's ultimately what we care about. But that's not actually the way that the statistical test goes. Okay, so what, what, does, what does any of this have to do? Oh, and then D is, you know, now it should be a little, hopefully a little bit clearer why these things are really not the same thing, even though they kind of all contain the same ingredients, but some of them have it the other way around, okay? And this is a really, really crucial distinction. And it's not, it's not a very intuitive distinction, in my opinion. So um, 